Oh no. Okay, so two problems. One I've got the nose cam. Oops. Life can better. Let's try the audio. Test speaker. Test microphone. Hello, this is Roger Terrell. Oh my gosh, who is that dork? Ah, okay. Hello, Rohini. You look very beautiful today. With many, Hi. <laughs> with many uh, flowers on your face. Let's see here. Um, what am I doing? Okay. I think I need to share a screen. What screen shall I share? Let's try sharing by application. Share. Okay. Okay, cool. It actually shows me the screen that I'm sharing. Oh, goodness. Um, so let me just do a quick check and see if I can share my webcam. Dot. Ah, Diane has an email for me. I will read your email, Diane. Good morning, folk. Let's see here. Uh, Mm -hmm. Ah, I know what I need to do. I know what I need to do. Just lots of little things. I need to start my web, my, my document camera. And it's gonna show me stuff. No, come on, come Good on. Good morning, Dr. Terrell. I have a quick question. No, no questions. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. I'm trying to get my stupid document camera to work. Oh, I see. What's your quick question? Sorry, I'm just being a jerk. No, you're good. Um, so I have lab on Thursday. Am I doing the Crystal Violet lab or the Ramachandran lab? I just want to make sure. Um, so, um, are you, what room are you in? DH11, Thursday, Group B. Yeah. Because I know. So then like, you're, you're doing you the Raman lab. You're going to do uh, the Raman lab. What was it again? Sorry. Yeah, DH11 does the Raman lab. DH10 does the UV Viz. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, ducky. Part of Chucky. Live mode. How about live mode? Still shows me nothing. Erg. Come on, I like my document camera. I paid extra dollars for my document camera. Let's see here. I'll try starting it one more time. Oh, come on. Hmm. 
You guys can't see what I'm doing, but I'm messing around. I'm trying to get my document camera to work. And it's not working. Hmm. Dirtle, dirtle. What lab are we doing this week? We are doing, uh, if you're in DH10, you are doing the UV vis of crystal violet. It's called lab zero. And if you are in DH11, you are doing uh, Raman, which is lab five, I think. All right. So, are you guys ready to talk about what happens when a molecule absorbs light? Everybody say, so yay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cindy. <laughs> that just took all the cynicism right out of me. I love it. <laughs> oh, cool. So can you guys still see the, uh, the, uh, um, PowerPoint stuff? Yes, um, we can. I will take no answer is yes. Good. Excellent. Okay. So, um, okay. No, this is titrations. We are want to be here. And um, uh, so what happens when a molecule absorbs light? So basically, um, it, it's, it's a sort of a mysterious, but really um, uh, interesting part of uh, chemistry and physics, that when light interacts with molecules, all these quantum tra um, transfers of energy take place, you know, and this is just like, we just observe this to happen. And when Warner, Warner Heisenberg first, first, you know, broke things down in this way, he was like giving up. He was like, I can't figure these damn things out. I'm just going to have to um, just say, okay, this is before photon, this is after. I do not know how things work. And so this is what happens, you know? And um, uh, so, you know, all of, all of the quantum mechanics that describes the interactions of light with molecules is basically grounded in this surrender, you know? This complete and utter surrender by Werner Heisenberg, and then later on by um, Ernst Schrodinger, um, who uh, basically, you know, they, they were saying, we have no idea what's happening to the molecules. You know, they're, are they particle, are they little particles like, like things orbiting a, 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 are they electrons orbiting a, a, a central nucleus? Are they, um, you know, um, are they like little water droplets? Are they like little, you know, all these models just fell apart. Nobody could do anything with, nobody could make any kind of predictions at all that worked. So what they started doing was just saying, okay, well, let's just assume that energy is conserved, right? That's a super important one, by the way. Super important. Energy is conserved and uh, momentum is conserved and angular momentum, like that's sort of a subset of momentum. But um, so these, they, they, they went with these conservation ideas and then they just said, okay, before photon interacts with molecule, it's a ground state molecule. After photon inter interacts with molecule, it's an excited state molecule, you know? And in fact, what happens is all these uh, parameters that describe a molecule, the bond angles, the bond lengths, um, the amount of energy stored in, uh, in the molecule in the form of electronic potential energy and vibrational potential energy, and um, even nuclear spin, even though we don't really get into that. Um, all these potential energy states can change when a photon interacts with the molecule. And that's all we know. That's it. 
do not fool yourself. Do not do not buy into any of the quantum. Well, I mean, nobody actually says it because it's a dirty little secret, right? That's all we know is that photon comes in, energy is conserved, and then nothing comes out, but the molecule has a new amount of energy that's equal to um, the uh, prior amount plus the photon energy, right? Now, the, um, the orthodoxy is that um, when a molecule interacts with a photon, uh, there, there needs to be a state, like the photon energy in order to interact with the molecule, there needs to be a state of the molecule at the energy level of the molecule plus the energy level of the photon. Does that make sense? So, um, uh, for example, if you have like ground state hydrogen, right? Um, then uh, a photon, in order for a photon to be absorbed, is another way of putting it, there needs to be an electronic plus vibrational plus rotational plus nuclear spin state at exactly that photon energy above the ground state of the atom or, or molecule, right? So um, uh, for example, if you have, um, you know, uh, formaldehyde down here, right? And it's thrumming along in its ground state, or, you know, it could be even in an excited state, but let's just think of it in its ground state. That means that the the vibrations, every vibration is actually happening, but it's in its lowest energy state, right? And the electrons are all orbiting in their lowest energy state, right? And uh, I can't, I forget whether it's rotating or not um, in the in the absolute ground state. Uh, perhaps J is equal to zero, I'm not sure. Um, and then when a, when a photon comes along of just the right energy, it will take that molecule and, and the photon will be absorbed, it will disappear, it will cease to exist, and the molecule will now be in an excited state. And nobody knows how that happens, but it happens, right? So, um, uh, so that is the orthodoxy, that there's, that there's a state, a molecular state, at a level above the absorbing state equal to the photon energy state, right? So, um, you know, the, the easiest way to do that is with an energy level diagram. So, um, so for example, um, let's, let's uh, play a game here. Like here's formaldehyde, right? It has 12 valence electrons and the, the lowest lying valence electron is in the sigma one state and the carbon oxygen bond mainly, right? Now, sigma, sigma one carbon oxygen, right? That means um, that, um, you know, this is the, this is, you know, if you put it into Lewis structure terms, this is the single bond between carbon and oxygen. Then there's also a carbon oxygen. Uh, there's another, uh, well, there's another carbon hydrogen bond called sigma two, another carbon hydrogen and oxygen bond called sigma three, right? And these both have one nodal plane, but that's okay. And then there's a sigma four, right? And uh, the sigmas all have one thing in common, which is that the sigmas place electron density in between the atoms. Those of you who've had 145 will recognize this feature of a, a so-called sigma bond, that there is electron density um, 
along the plane of the bond or um, along the bond axis, right? So this sigma two here has a lot of electron density along the CH bonds, right? And this guy has a bunch of electron density along the CH and the CO bonds, right? And uh, I'm not exactly sure about this guy. <laughs> It looks like it's kind of along the CO bond. Uh, anyway, but then there's also pi bonds here, right? And these pi bonds here, uh, they're also, uh, they're, there's no star, right? So that means that there's electron density along the bond axis, right? And that relative to this electron being elsewhere, there's a stabilizing effect on the molecule of having the, um, uh, electron there. So uh, if you were to stretch the bond out uh, on the molecule, then the energy of the molecule will tend to increase. You know, that's um, really all that means, right? And uh, thank you, God, for your uh, beneficence in making most, making it possible for most molecules to have a closed shell. The whole counting thing was really cool. Thank you again, God. And so part of the counting thing is that, you know, uh, that there can be, um, for most molecules, uh, ground states where all of the electrons are in bonding states, right? So things tend to stick together, right? When you've got heavy nuclei and light electrons, the, the energy of those states is lower when they come together to form molecules than when, when they're torn apart. Therefore, our molecule, our universe condenses into molecules at this state, right? And then, um, and so these are all occupied states here. And you take all the electrons from the neutral carbons, all the electrons from the neutral hydrogens, all the electrons from the neutral oxygens, you add them up and there they are. Right? These are just the valence electrons, not the cores, right? And then there exists above these energy states a state called star. And this is the this is the, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital here. It's called the LUMO. The LUMO, the first LUMO is in the pi star state, right? And so it's possible then to excite an electron from this pi state to this pi star state, and probably from the n state to the pi star state. Uh, sigma to pi star does not happen normally because that violates the conservation of angular momentum of the electrons, I believe. So there's a spin angular momentum mismatch between pi star and sigma. So pi and pi star and n to pi star, those are allowed transitions. And one of and and in order for this transition to happen, first a, a, a photon has to have the right amount of energy to transition between n and pi star. And two, it has to have the right um, spin, angular momentum, be, to go from n to pi star. So, um, you know, photons are spin one, for example. So um, anyway, I don't exactly know how that works in there. I'm not a p-chemist, but th there is a conservation law for angular momentum there. So um, uh, so talking about electronic transitions again, right? Um, you can have a ground state molecule down here where you have both electrons in the non-bonding state. This is just looking at the upper. This is the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital. And this is the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And the... Um, And so you can take, for example, this spin up electron and you can 
take it from here and put it here. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can take this spin up electron and take it from here and put it here, right? And this conserves the angular momentum of the um, electrons, right? Down and up, down and up and down and up. I forget what happens to the angular momentum of the photon. I don't know. I'm going to ask a P chemist here this question. So then, um, uh, then what can happen to this molecule through collisional or other mechanisms is that this electron can change state. It can go from spin down to spin up, right? Or honestly, this one can go from spin up to spin down, right? And either of those can change. And when that, when that new state forms, that's called a triplet state. So there's a singlet electronic state and a triplet electronic state. And for um, uh, reasons that are apparent only to the physical chemist, the triplet letter electronic states are slightly lower in energy than the singlet electronic states. So when, when you flip, uh, for example, this spin, right? Then both of these electronic energy uh, states lower in energy. So that's sort of a long-winded way of saying that for this ground state, there, there are two possible excited states, one at a higher energy, one at a lower energy. Either one can be achieved from the ground state using a photon, but one requires help from some kind of a collision some other um, uh, mechanism by which the whole thing can conserve angular momentum. So something has to change by one quantum of angular momentum. Uh, So here's an interesting statement. In a magnetic field, a singlet state remains a single single state. What the bleep does that mean? <laughs> who, who said that it was anything other than a single state? <laughs> ah, okay. So in a magnetic field, a triplet state splits into three states. Okay, I'm not really sure exactly how to interpret that. But um, in any case, um, yeah, okay, let's leave that. So, um, so let's talk about the different energy regimes of uh, molecular absorptions, right? Basically, you've got electronic, rotational, and vibrational energies, or actually in, in order of energy, rotational is the lowest, vibrational is higher, and electronic is, is highest energy state for molecules to absorb uh, electromagnetic radiation. And I, of course, ignored nuclear spin states there, which they're much, much, much lower even than rotational. So infrared and microwave radiation, these are lower energy um, photons. They're not ex energetic enough to introduce electronic transitions. So um, uh, they, um, they do uh, induce, they, they, or they can induce stretching uh, transitions or vibrational transitions rather that can be uh, symmetric, anti-symmetric stretching, bending, um, et cetera, uh, rocking, other, other modes, right? And, um, you know, for formaldehyde, you can, there's only uh, four atoms, right? 
And so there are three times four is 12 minus six modes of vibration. So it's three N minus six, right? Now, um, and that's for a nonlinear molecule. So three times four is 12 minus six modes of vibration. One of them is the symmetric stretch. This is where the oxygen goes up and the two hydrogens go out, right? And there's a, there's a conservation of the center of mass of the molecule when this vibration happens, right? So in fact, this central carbon doesn't move very much. And the oxygen move, doesn't move very much, but the hydrogens rel move relatively large amplitude. And when the oxygen is going out, the hydrogen is going out and the other hydrogen is going out. So it's, it's expanding and contracting. Right. And then there's an anti-symmetric mode that goes along with that symmetric mode. And I don't know, on average, the vibration, the center of mass of the molecule is preserved, you know, but it's just kind of more wacky, you know, these, kind of these atoms have different trajectories, you know? And um, I, it, 10 years ago, there were great tools online for, for visualizing these modes, but now they're all gone. I don't know where they are. Ah, I used to have them in my lectures. And it was really cool because you could see the little molecules, blah, 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 you know, flopping around and spinning and everything, but, but no more, you can't see that. Probably they got killed by the p-chemists who, who like object to these simplified pictures. Like, and it's sort of rich because you know, um, for the p-chemist, their actual, they actually have no models for the motion, so they're actually even simpler. Anyway, so um, anyway. So the, the photons can excite the rotations, the vibrations, and the electronic states, right? And um, so if, if the molecule is linear, there are three N minus five vibrations. And if the molecule is nonlinear, there are three N minus six. And I had a funny thing happen to me the other day and I was thinking, Oh my God, who can even name a molecule with more than three atoms that's completely linear, you know? I was thinking of HCN at the time, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of diatomics, right? Which are by definition linear, right? Because there's only two atoms, right? Then there's at least one triatomic, which is HCN, and all those atoms are in the same line, right? And I was thinking, oh my God, who can even name a molecule that's linear, that's more than three atoms, right? And right next to me, there was a tank of acetylene, which is HCCH, which is linear, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's completely, um, uh, you know, but although I, I don't think that there are more than four atom molecules that are linear, right? So the three N minus five has somewhat limited applications, but for small atoms, it's cool. Let, let's put in a two here, right? If you have three times two minus five, you only have one mode of vibration, right? So if you have two atoms, there's only one mode where they just, they just stretch, right? It's a symmetric stretch, you know? Anyhow, so, um, uh, Yeah. Oh, interesting here. Like there's, um, uh, if you take three times N, that's the total of translational, rotational and vibrational states. That's interesting. Yeah. I did not realize that. That's pretty cool. I'm sure it's been told to me many, many times, but it just sort of dawned on me that there is 
there is a limit here. Okie dokie. All right. So um, if all the atoms are going the same direction on one axis, that's translation. Uh, if they're going opposite directions, that's a rotation. And then a vibration is anything else, and either combination of motions, you know? Huh, anyway, we'll think about that more later. Okay, so um, let's talk uh, let's talk briefly about the the electronic absorption, the lexicon of electronic absorptions here. And I'll explain this uh, diagram. I'm gonna get a cup of coffee, I'll be right back. I'm in my office right now. Okay, so um, now this this is called a Jablonski diagram here. It's basically just um, it has a thick line at the bottom, which is the lowest energy uh, for that collection of atoms. So this is the ground state, right? And uh, above the ground state. There are vibrational and ro rotational energy states. And what we've shown here are the vibrational energy states. So in FTIR, for example, uh, one goes pretty generally from the ground to the first vibrational excited state. These are the infrared absorptions that can happen with molecules. And um, there are 3n minus five, normal, or 3n minus six, rather, um, of these manifolds, right? So there's a ton of states. That's what I'm saying there, right? And um, so, if you just look way down here, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of states. And if you're using these low energy infrared photons, you can scan over these states and you get an infrared absorption, right? Get an FTIR infrared absorption, or also a Raman spectrum. You can see these guys down here, right? Now, if you're talking about visible photons, they're about 10 times higher in energy. And what can happen is that the ground state molecule, this is ground electronic and ground vibrational energy state molecule, can absorb a photon into an excited vibrational state of an excited electronic state. So you get into, there's, there's uh, uh, two excitations that occur simultaneously, right? Now, one of the things that happens immediately here is that the um, is that the vibrational energy is dumped into the vibrational bath, and um, that if you if you think about that, that means you're smart, but you're destined to be poor because. Um, this ha this crashed and burned you know 60 or more careers in the 1980s and 1990s because um uh chemists and physicists together they thought oh my gosh we can tune specific chemical reactions if we pump energy into the vibrational mode of the bond that needs to break, 
right? So an organic synthetic chemist says, oh my gosh, we've got to break the CH bond. Let's pump energy in with a laser, excite that CH bond vibrations so that it's more likely to break and then we'll get it to react and then boom, and then Nobel Prize City, right? And they would have gotten a Nobel Prize. They probably would have given several Nobel Prizes for that, but it never happened. It never happened, right? Because as soon as this state is formed, it relaxes back down in a non-radiative way. This is this R1 here, this relaxation is very fast um, and it leaves the state in the, in the upper electronic state but the ground vibrational state of that upper electronic state, right? And then there's, uh, there can be one of two things that happen, either an internal conversion or an inner system crossing. And these are just fancy words for saying, either it's gonna um, uh, convert into the ground, a very excited vibrational state of the ground electronic state, and then um, that will relax, right? And this is the wiggly lines here means that there's a state change, but there's no photon created during this process, right? So here's a non-radiative transfer to here and a non-radiative transfer down to here. And the, the energy is all dumped into translational modes of motion, presumably, right? Now, once it relaxes here, there's another, there's another two possibilities really, right? One is fluorescence, which comes down to honestly one of these states. And then the other is uh, inner system crossing into a triplet state where there's a spin flip. There's a second non-radiative relaxation and then a phosphorescence uh, event, right? Now, fluorescence, uh, Harris defines as 10 to the minus to 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus four seconds. And I would argue that he is two orders of magnitude too slow there because we're really talking 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus six. I mean, even, even a, a almost um, all fluorescent molecules are one nanosecond or faster. So, well, I don't know. Anyway, I go too far. Now I'm just trying to show off. But, but I know that there are, there are many nanosecond and sub nanosecond um, fluorescent states. And 10 to the minus four is two orders of magnitude slower than Skoog puts it. So basically these are very fuzzy distinctions between fluorescence and phosphorescence, right? And you'll notice here that there is a, a, a distinction between fluorescence and phosphorescence in lifetime, right? As opposed to basically what states they're coming from. Fluorescence um, really is defined by the states. And, that, and this, this state transition here is allowed. That means that there's no change in angular momentum between S1 and S0. But there is a change in angular mo momentum between T1 and S0. Just like there's an angular momentum change between S1 and T1, right? So, um, I'm thinking about circular polarization here. Give me a second. I gotta make a note to myself. It's all these funny thoughts are coming up to me today because we're talking about photophysics. Um, S1, T1. What is angular momentum of circularly polarized light? Okay. So there's, so these processes tend to be slow, right? Um, 
So let me give you an example of a slow process. Anything that glows in the dark. Okay. So Casey, do you have any glow in the dark items in your life? I don't think so. No, no Not stars. I was young. Me. Somebody has stars stuck to the ceiling. I Plastic stars. Brandon? My husband has a glow in the dark moon t shirt. Excellent example. <laughs> Excellent example. Excellent example. I don't have anything for you. Do you have, do you have Brandon? Um, I, I had some glow sticks before, but that was from like Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. The trouble is, I don't know whether they're. I don't know whether they're fluorescent or phosphorescent. Yeah, I have no idea either. Okay, so phosphorescence, right? Those that that glow in the dark T-shirt of Cynthia's husband, it glows for a long time, right? Well, I don't know, I don't know if you've even seen it glow, but you know, idea is that it glows for like at least ten minutes, maybe up to an hour, right? Yeah, it, it keeps. Yeah, it'll go for a while. Yeah. I mean, you, you, he'll wear it to bed, so it's like, I don't see. <laughs> but it's like, you know, he's walking to bed. It's like, okay, I see this glow coming across the room. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Ask him that. You should do an experiment next time. Turn the light off until, okay, you just have to stay, stay up until we, it, the right, light turns off. Right, 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 right. Take pictures. <laughs> it's at least a few minutes. <laughs> Take pictures and measure the phosphorescence lifetime. That's how you would do that, right? You take a picture at time zero, right? When you turn the lights off. And then over time, the, the, the phosphorescence will decay, right? And here, he has an upper limit of 10 to the two seconds, which is way, way too short, you know? Because even the, what happens is that um, the, the, the phosphorescence in those items is from mishmetal. It's from a mixture of lanthanides and actinides that they just dig them up in Sweden and they kind of purify them a little bit. And then they get this mish metal. It's, it's a bunch of metal oxides and stuff that it, it's just a mixture of these uh, metals that have F orbitals. And the F transitions, uh, there's a ton of them. And uh, the uh, upper electronic states there, they tend to get stuck in those states and then they slowly luminesce as they, as they transition down through their, their forbidden T1 to S0 transitions, right? And so that is an example of phosphorescence, right? There's, there's light absorption and then light emission, right? Now light absorption directly into phosphorescent states is not listed here right because it's also very weak like if you if you put photons in of exactly this energy or exactly you know any one of these t s0 to t1 states you'd find the absorption is maybe 0.1 to maybe 1 to 10 at the upper limit of extinction coefficient per molar per centimeter right and so these um, these are weak absorptions. They're also similarly weak emissions. But that's why they last a long time. And that's why they're glowing in the dark and not glowing in the light because they're so weak, you can't see them glowing when they're in the light. <laughs> and they're also busy absorption, absorbing at the same rate probably, right? So, so phosphorescence is a sort of a strange subset uh, of luminescence where the upper states uh, differ from the lower states in, in spin multiplicity. They go from T to S, right? And then phosphorescence, they're strong absorbers and strong emitters, right? So what you see in phosphorescence is if there's a light shining on it, they look weird, right? There's, for example, glow in the dark is a fluorescent phenomenon, right? You have to turn on the ultraviolet light and then 
the thing will start to shine in the visible, right? So you'll turn on a UV light that will pump the molecules up here. They will non-radiatively decay, then they will luminesce in the visible, right? And that goes, that turns off as soon as you turn off the black light, right? The ultraviolet light. All right, so I think that's all we want to say here other than, you know, uh, what's fast and what's slow? Well, fluorescence is fast, phosphorescence is slow, absorption is wicked fast. Sorry for the no Nobel prizes. Uh, internal conversion in our system crossing. You guys can look at those um, definitions. Basically, these are the things that I've said here. Um, A is down here. R1 is up here. Internal conversion is here. R2 is here. No, R2 is here, right? Uh, that's, not, that's only heat. That just creates heat in the molecule. And um, this inner system crossing can lead to light. Or it can do it can inner system cross and then only lead to heat there, right? So there's a bunch of ways that it can lead to heat, and only a couple of ways that it leads to light, right? One of the unfortunate things about this diagram is that it fails to include um, these all, these processes here, which correspond to excited states of the ground um, electronic state. Oh, I knew I was going to do that. So what happens is that um, you know this this single bold green line down green line here <laughs> would correspond to an emission line, a single emission at a single wavelength, and that that's a line because of the way the cameras were set up. You know that there'd be a they would look at the film and there'd be a line on the film and that would be a single wavelength emission, right? If there's a series of lines, it's called a band, right? And lines are generally only observed for monatomics, like things like helium, hydrogen atoms, things like that, right? Neon, for example, has beautiful line spectra. But band spectra appear whenever there's a vibrational mode uh, possible, right? And the band spectrum will appear when there's a transition down to here and a transition down to here and a transition down to here. Like these are all possible, right? 
And so it, it, the combination of all these downward going lines, same in phosphorescence, is that um, in the gas phase, it'll create a band, a series of discrete lines. And in the condensed phase, that is liquid or solid, it will create a smooth band, right? It will create, a, sorry, not, I don't know if you would call it a band anymore, but it'll create a smooth peak, right? And, and that's where there's many, many, many different molecules and slightly different energy states from the coordination of, of other molecules. And they combine into a, a broad uh, ensemble average, it's called. It's an average of states, right? Okay, so um, uh, here's an interesting uh, uh, look at the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence, right? So um, in this green spectrum here, at 25 degrees C, you can see a certain emission intensity in the fluorescent wavelength and a slightly lower um, intensity in the phosphorescence wavelength, right? And the reason that you know that they're fluorescence and phosphorescence in this case, using only the green data is, um, well, you don't know, just using the green data. <laughs> Oops, sorry, kind of got in a... But if you, if you then heat it up to from 25 to 65 and you see the fluorescence go down, but the phosphorescence channel go up, or this, I, I should say that this second channel goes up, this longer wavelength channel goes up, then you can say, aha, this is undoubtedly phosphorescent, right? Because what's happening as you increase the temperature is you increase the number of collisions per second. And so you increase the chance of inter-system crossing Inter-system crossing, yes. I use the right one. Internal conversion is the other way, but inter-system crossing from the fluorescent to the phosphorescent manifolds, right? Beautiful, very beautiful. Now luminescence here is um, uh, the emission of light from an excited state molecule. That's that's a good, um, I mean, luminescence is, you know, basically most luminescence is fluorescence, right? And fluorescence is the, is the emission of light following the absorption of a photon, right? And they're generally, you know, Stokes shifted. That means that the light that's emitted is longer wavelength than the light that's absorbed. Chemiluminescence is the emission of light following the chemical reaction of a molecule. So uh, here is uh, luminol. It's this sort of purine type molecule. And if you treat it with nitric oxide or peroxide in base in the presence of a metal catalyst, like probably iron, then it will, it will pop these two nitrogens out and give you blue light. Pretty cool that it gives blue light too. I think that's pretty cool. One of the more useful wavelengths, right? Because you can do all kinds of stuff with it, right? So um, if you wanted to analyze for luminol, you could do so extremely sensitively and the way you would do it is you would set your spectrometer to detect this blue light. You'll put the luminol in, collect the baseline, then dump in a bunch of peroxide and catalyst, and then just monitor the blue light as it, as it goes up and comes down. So um, here is a, uh, a whitener in white fabrics, right? It's a sodium salt of a polycyclic aromatic uh, compound, uh, the name of which I could not tell you, but um, 
uh, and then other uh, naturally fluorescent molecules are tonic water, uh, turmeric, and highlighter ink, right? And then the glow-in-the-dark toys, like um, certain people's husbands' t-shirts, are phosphorescent. And uh, so let's see here. Um, uh, here, also, a, a, an example of luminescence is the um, PN junction in a blue uh, light emitting diode or, or any kind of light emitting diode, really. And um, in that PN junction, uh, blue light is transmitted out. And there's also a phosphor coating on here, which it emits an extremely broad phosphorescent uh, radiation in the, uh, centered on the yellow. And so if you look at the spectrum of any white um, LED, you'll see that there's a, a large peak in the blue and then another uh, broader band centered on the yellow. So this is an interesting, it was pretty disappointing for me when I figured that out because I needed red light and they're pretty weak in the red. But that's okay. Um, okay, so here is a nod. Gosh, we've got a ton of territory to cover here. That's okay, we'll get through what we can today. And there's a big section that amounts to nothing down below too. So um, uh, recently there's uh, been a, uh, some, there was a Nobel Prize given uh, last year. This year it was CRISPR, last year it was super resolution, I think, uh, uh, for um, a single molecule uh, fluorescence detection. Uh, in in the in the in the guise of super resolution, right? So um, what is now the case is that it's it's very possible to detect individual fluorescing molecules because um, the molecules have gone through a lot of um, synthetic evolution into some very chemically stable forms. And these chemically stable fluorophores can emit, um, uh, let's just say, a lot of photons. So you can you can irradiate them with a with a um, uh, say an ultraviolet or a blue light, for example, and just keep irradiating them, and they'll keep fluorescing for a long time. Then eventually they will bleach, and they'll die forever, right? Or sometimes they can isomerize and they'll go dark for a period of time and then they'll turn back on. So there's bleaching and blinking phenomena. But, um, hi Van, am I interesting again? <laughs> I love you Van, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a hard time. I'm giving you a hard time. So. Uh, the, uh, these uh, dye molecules can be detected at the single molecule level because they can emit so many photons in a, in a fairly short period of time, right? So their, their lifetime might be in the nanoseconds, maybe one nanosecond. That means they can produce a billion photons per second, roughly, which is bright enough to see in a good microscope, you know? a billion photons per second um, uh, as 10 to the ninth. And so that's, um, you know, uh, I don't know, it's not much light power, right? It's in the femtowatts, but it's, you know, it's getting up there where you can see the single molecule, right? And then so long as you can, as long as there's few enough of these molecules in the field of a microscope, the image you see, will see might look like this, right? This is the uh, microscopic image, right? And this is under normal far field diffraction limited imaging, right? 
But then if all you need to do is make the assumption that what is really happening is that there's a, a bunch of points of light that are creating intensity profiles, Gaussian intensity profiles. And then you do the statistics on each Gaussian to find the center, say the 95% confidence interval for the center. And then you can collapse from this histogram down to mu, the center of that histogram then you put a bright dot on the synthetic image where the center of that light source was, and you can go from this to this, right? This is called super resolution fluorescence microscopy. And the only assumption that it makes is that this is made up of a bunch of dots like this. Right? It's not some, they're not smeared out light sources. They're point sources. And there's a bunch of point sources. And that's a good assumption when you're talking about dye molecules. You know, on a, on a short time scale, the dye molecules are trapped, right? And, um, and they're not moving so fast, right? And they're sitting there, they're emitting, saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And your detector is detecting this envelope of emissions, right? And you're telling your computer, hey, you see that envelope? Find the center of that envelope for me. And the computer saying, okay, I'll do that. That center is right, blink, it'll, it'll find a point right there, right? And that will be the center of the super resolution image. And so I think it's pretty cool, they basically, because you're using something that humans aren't good at, which is detecting the dynamic range of these. Each of these pixels is collected with a very deep dynamic range of, of intensity measurements, right? And we're using that information to create this spectrum. Okay, shutting up now. Was that interesting or not? Okay, don't answer that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Cool. Thank you. You definitely, whoever said that gets 10 brownie points. Solomon, like usual. Yeah. <laughs> that was Solomon. Yeah, I gave you a thumbs up. Oh, oh you did. Okay. All right. But, um, but you took away, if, if you identify your own brownie points, you lose five brownie points. Okay. <laughs> but you still get your real points. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> that's kind of cruel, isn't it? Anyway, so here's here's an example of a real uh, absorption slash emission spectrum of a real dye, right? And this guy here has um, uh, uh, it has a series of these. There's probably one, two, three, four. These are actually electronic states of this molecule, right? And each of these electronic states has a bunch of vibrational substates. And so they, they form these smooth looking, um, this smooth looking black absorption band in the, um, in the visible, right? However, if you uh, irradiate it at uh, 280 or so, to, no, no, to 260, take half of this wavelength here. That's the irradiation wavelength here. Then you can see this, um, there's this luminescence pattern that's created here, right? Now, why does this, does the green one look like the black one? But, sh but fold it off to the right. And that is because of uh, the symmetry, or I'm sorry, the similarity between the um, vibrational states of the ground state and the vibrational states of the excited states.
I really wish I had my my um, document camera because it's a perfect time to sort of go into that, but it just doesn't work sometimes. It's when I use the the anyway. So um, let me let me put in a. So So what we're seeing here is on in the black, we're seeing the excitation from from the ground vibrational state of the ground electronic state, right? So we're seeing an excitation from here going up into this state. Into this state. Into this state, etc. And these guys should all be black. And then in the green, what we're seeing is the emission from which state? This one, this one, this one, or this one? The lowest, exactly right. Exactamundo, right? We're seeing a mission from this state here. And the longest wavelength peak we see at like 700 is going to be from there down to here, right? I'll make this guy green, right? Right. So we're seeing these excitations there in the black and these emissions there in the green. The black ones are longer because they are electronic plus vibrational. The green ones are shorter because they are electronic minus vibrational. That is an important idea. That is the that is the idea behind uh, Stokes shift in fluorescence. 
Absorption is electronic plus vi upper state vibrational. Emission is electronic minus lower state vibrational. Okie dokie, coolios. Let's look at a color plate. Now these are just color plates. These are just colors, that's all they are. Anyways, I'll let you look at them at your leisure there. It's kind of cool. There's one illustrating, illustrating refraction from Michelson Laboratory in China Lake, California. China Lake is where Dan Harris works, right? Or maybe he's retired by now. But China Lake, it is in, uh, it's in the Mojave Desert. It's in Southern California. And I used to work out there, right? I, however, did not work in Michelson Laboratory. <laughs> I worked at our Sierra Ranches, which was a hay farm, which was, you know, maybe 20 or 30 miles from uh, uh, Michelson Laboratories, right? And um, it was a crazy year for me. But one of the weird things we used to see is all these crazy, crazy aircraft flying in and out of uh, China Lake. And it was, it was like, like Independence Day. I mean, there were just these weird looking aircraft and they'd be flying low and slow and coming over us and like, oh my God, what is this thing, you know? That was kind of cool. Anyway. Oh, you know what? All that drawing, there it is. Jeesh. My God. I did all that drawing, and then there it is. Relation between absorption and emission spectra, right? Anyway, this is all the stuff I've said about them, you know? One thing I didn't, I, I failed to represent here there's two concepts, right? One is that when you go from ground to ground, this, this is a resonance line. That means that lambda zero is absorbed, lambda zero is emitted, right? That is a, called a resonance line. And then the reason that um, Well, there's the Frank Condon principle here, right? Which is one one of the one of the important concepts that's kind of going around here, which is that um, uh, the emission spectrum comes at a slightly lower energy, or there is a Stokes shift, right? And another way of looking at this is that the energy is absorbed instantaneously, right? And what happens is the S1 state is created, but with S0 solvation and, ge and molecular geometry, right? Then there's a relaxation to S1 with S1 geometry, and then an instantaneous emission to S0 with S1 geometry and solvation, right? So um, this, this is basically uh, a, a very glib way of introducing a couple of new ideas. Um, one is the fact that, you know, a, a large molecule, like a typical fluorescent molecule, can have a variety of different shapes and conformations and 
configurations, right? It can be stretched, it can be crunched, it can be twisted, it can be, there can be all kinds of different configurations of that molecule. And when when it, when light is absorbed, that's sort of, an, that is considered an instantaneous process, right? So none of the nuclei. Hello, little van. Hello, what's your name? Oh, her name is Tara. Tana? Tara. Tara? Hi. <laughs> Darn, she's not going to show her face anymore. <laughs> oh, now she turned her camera off. Okay. Oh, well. So, but there's the molecule can, it basically it's changed instantly, right, by the photon. And it's like a little bit out of equilibrium with its environment. Then it relaxes down into, okay, now in this new electronic excited state, ah, I'm happy now. But then, boom, the photon leaves. And now it's now it's back in the ground state. It's like, oh, geez, I'm not so happy. And then it relaxes from there down to the the happy, happy place. You know, does that make sense? OK, good. Excellent. <laughs> OK, so um, I think I've said enough for several weeks. Um, uh, and um, I would like to um, if there's any quick questions, I can take them now. And um, otherwise, I will see everybody Thursday. I, when is the homework due, guys? Is it due Friday night? I think it's Friday. due Friday. Yeah. 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 It, and this next set is quite a bit easier than the last set. So it's much more qualitative. Yeah, it's much more qualitative. So that should be good. Hopefully, that's a little relief for everybody. Okay. Nicholas, how are you doing? I'm alive. You're alive. Do you have a bad case of senioritis? Maybe not bad, but I think I have it. <laughs> Don't give it to anybody. Don't give it to anybody else. That's where I got it. Well, I'm getting oh. junior. I have junioritis. It's not good. Oh my gosh. Nicholas, you gave junioritis to Cindy. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, okay, deny it then, deny it. Okay, good, that's perfect. <laughs> Solomon, how are you doing? Solomon's, Solomon's no, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. Yay, Solomon's here. <laughs> I'm here, that's why I was on mute. I'm doing good. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tarot? Yes. Uh, do we have to do a pre-lab before coming to lab? No, no pre-labs, no pre-labs. I am not organized oh, thank you. enough to give you guys pre labs. Okay, good. I will see everybody in lab. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and um, I will, yes, and I'll see everybody Thursday. Uh, Dr. Carroll? Yes. Um, when is the lab report due? Ah, so um, I promise, actually, the, um, the Raman report, we're going to need to get into the next chapter. We're gonna to need to get through the next chapter. And the UVVIS report, um, I don't really care. So we'll make them do it at the same time, probably like in a couple weeks from now. And I'm sorry, I don't have a hard date for you. There will be a hard date, but it, it, it won't be for a couple weeks. Okay. So in, in the meantime, ignore whatever Canvas tells us? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. I'll try to fix it today. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye, Dr. T. Bye-bye.